Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, my name is Brother Bacchus. I'm here to promote Adra. Now, Adra, which we all know, is um, our charity worldwide. And for the last five years or so, we were unable to do any great collection owing to the lockdown. But this year, they have decided that they want to start it because the funds are getting low and the needs are great. So we're trying to raise money to help ADRA in the present project and the forthcoming project, what they have in mind. In doing so, Can we please stand as we sing our intro entering together?
Sabbath to you, church. Our call to worship is taken from Psalms 52, verse 8 and 9. And I'm reading from the NIV, and I'll read in your hearing. I trust in God unfailing love forever and ever. And I will praise you forever for what you have done. In your name, I will hope for your name is good, and I will praise you in the presence of all the saints. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Father God, we thank you for your holy Sabbath day. We wish you a happy Sabbath, Lord. We are truly blessed to be able to be called your children. And Lord, during this Easter weekend, we recognize that it's not about Easter eggs and chocolate. It's about celebrating your life, your death, and your resurrection. So on this holy Sabbath day, may we spend time remembering your life, your death, and your resurrection. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, happy Sabbath, and welcome to Windsor Street Church. Thank you for choosing to join with us, to be with us and worship, to worship with us today, whether you're here in person or those who are worshiping with us online. Um, at this time, we, we welcome our regular visitors. You're always welcome. But are there any um, visitors here this morning? Those who are, might be visiting for the first, second time? Do you want to indicate? Yes, do you want to say where you, who you are and where you're from? Thank you. Any more? I think we have. A com yes. Sorry. So, visiting from Turks and Caicos. Thank you. I think we have um, Camilla Barrett. I think. Are you here? Thank you for joining with us today, sister. Welcome. So. My hope is that we enjoy the Sabbath blessing and the service today. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, church. Are we glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Some of us have had some long weeks, but we come here to worship, to praise. And we serve a God who lives. Amen? Does he live? He lives. We're going to sing together. I serve a risen Savior.
and the burdens of my heart rolled away. We can lay our burdens where? At the cross. We're gonna sing together. try and hope in anything else it will fail us we can hope alone in Christ he will never let us down we're just going to sing through the story of Christ's life and death and resurrection in Christ alone my hope is
cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord.
Good morning and happy Sabbath church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Yes. Blessings, blessings. At this point in time, uh, it's the time of the 10 minute nuggets. And uh, it's my pleasure to call upon Sister Teresa and Gola to come over to do our 10 minute spots on um, uh, health ministries. Sister Teresa, over to you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Yes, it's 10 minute nuggets. Um, I think the church life is something that is new. It used to be happening at Windsor Street, but for some reason was like not happen. But the health ministry this year um, is bringing back the 10 minute nuggets. So what we decided, I just informed the church, the health ministry decided every quarterly we will have a theme of a health topic. Like this quarter, the first quarter, the topic is health eating. So next quarter, the topic will be exercise. Sister Yvonne last week spoke about health, um, health eating, how you put the portion. But the afternoon, we will go deeper to the topic. We will talk about protein. So protein, sometimes when people wanted to be, wanted to transaction to a plant-based eating habit, they is the protein that they become lost. So um, I will just bring a little bit of testimony. It was it happened. Ten minutes. I've been told ten minutes. I will do it ten minutes. <laughs> right. So when Vane was three years old, I think the church most of Windsor Street know there was a sermon about health. That sermon made Vane make a decision that he doesn't want to eat fish or meat. As a mother, I became lost. I didn't know what to do. And everybody was just like it. The school itself was telling like it, why your son is not eating meat or fish. And he used to refuse. No, it wasn't my decision. The boy decided not to eat. It was a struggle for me. So from that, I've learned to do a deep research about plant-based eating because of Vonell. So from there, I've learned the protein. There is a... So protein to be complete. There is a complete protein and incomplete protein. So there is a protein to be complete. They need to have the nine essential amino acids. So they are considered complete if they have all these nine essential amino acids. But the incomplete protein have less than that. Could have one, two, or three. Then you can combine them to make a complete protein. So the afternoon service will give the ears. Will if you wanted to know what is complete protein how to combine it, please come in this afternoon. So because as we get older, our body became deficient on protein. And it's important. And if we have less protein, our skin will become like a very fragile. And the heal, the, um, any disease to heal faster will like a, take longer. If you have a sufficient protein, it help your body to heal properly. If you are an elderly person, it is very good that your food is rich in protein and carbohydrates, but the whole grain of carbohydrates and protein. And there is, and we now learning that animal protein, it brings a lot of disease. Yeah, it's, and God is so good, and he made the plant, but he says, like, if my people is lack of uh, knowledge they will suffer yes so he just wants us to have a knowledge about that the afternoon program is to help the church educate the church with the how to you balance your plate and how to where do you find the protein plant-based protein with the nine essential amino acids so i'm just invite the church please if you are vegan if you are vegetarian if you are meat eater, please come and learn. And so I'm sure you will be well educated with uh, the plant base and the protein. But I will not talk about now because otherwise I have to repeat myself in the afternoon. I hope the church come in the afternoon to listen to the topic of uh, how to eat healthy. Amen. Amen. Wow. 
what a good, uh, that was very informative, Sister Teresa. We just thank the Lord, you know, for these testimonies. Uh, one thing I forgot to say was that uh, we won't have testimonies. But uh, at the exception of our um, brother Badford, he doesn't normally come to church, so we'll just give that only uh, time for him to come and uh, do his testimony. Good morning to all. I just come and say something. How am I long? My sickness come from man and they went they went to they went to Pakistan now these people can't touch him we are used to work then they went to Pakistan and get the people what I believe was God because look how we look how we start the people this one man and he asked him if we can choose, if we can choose for him. The man said that they all do it, and now the government saying, well, we now say no got the money, but are waiting. Okay, I'll, I'll deal with it now. All right. Okay, the, let me start here. Okay. Amen. Um, okay, but a bit for the, which, a lot of you probably don't know who he really is. He was a very active member of our church here. Myself and him and the late Brother Brown spent a lot of time in this church from the last 20 years. But now he's, um, he's homebound. But he just wanted to say thank you very much for all your prayers and your um, And he's doing quite well. Um, last week, the Sabbath school, Gloria went and visited him. Today, he's in church. Just us pray for him. And thank you very much. Amen. Amen, church. Hey, uh, my wife is out of hospital. We just praise the Lord for that. Thank you. At this point in time, we will have a song just before we pray. Um, and then we'll have a song and then from that we will take our comfortable positions of prayer as the song comes to an end. Over to you, praise team. Let's sing together sweet hour of prayer. about our eyes are closed at this time father in heaven we thank you dear lord for the gift of life we thank you for waking us up this morning we thank you dear lord that you have blessed us with health with strength and with all that is our being in us dear lord we come to your throne of grace at this point in time humbling ourselves into your courts. Iniquitated as we are, dear Lord, filthy, ragged, dear Lord, as we are, 
we are humbling ourselves to you at this point in time. Collectively as a church, dear Lord, as we have heard, dear Lord, from your children, dear Lord, about how we should conduct ourselves, how we should uh, be able, dear Lord, to maintain our health and our being, dear Lord. We know that, dear Lord, this journey is not a journey that is easy. But with you on our side, dear Lord, things are possible. There are no hindrances, there are no obstacles, are there any hurdles, dear Lord, when we are with you. For all we can conquer with you, dear Lord. We know that, dear Lord, that we are in a time where we face challenges, we face things, dear Lord, that are upcoming to our uh, existence in terms of what the world is and how it's portraying itself. Atrocities, challenges that are out there, dear Lord. But you have warned us, you have given us, dear Lord, the hope that when we see these things, we are to look up. We must know that your time is near, dear Lord. May you help us in our endeavors, dear Lord, that we can be able to withstand the calamities, dear Lord, that are for us, dear Lord. I pray for the church at large at this point in time. May you pour your Holy Spirit, dear Lord, over your children. As they minister, as they go out there, dear Lord, to proclaim your good news and your soon coming, may you be in the midst, dear Lord. Bless this, dear Lord, the church as it goes forward, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Lord, even for the testimony of our uh, brother Bedford as he came, dear Lord, to testify on your glory and your grace and your goodness, dear Lord. We want to say thank you, dear Lord, for everything that you have done for us, dear Lord. And we know that, dear Lord, with you, dear Lord, everything is possible. And I want to pray for our speaker for today, Pastor, who's going to, Pastor Campbell, who's going to be our speaker for the day, dear Lord. May you bless him in a special way. Touch his lips. Touch his whole being, dear Lord. Touch him with your cord of love. Whatever that comes out of his mouth, may it not be him who speaks, but may he hide, hide behind the cross. And you only, dear Lord, that you must speak through him, so that, dear Lord, whenever this is well and done, dear Lord, we can be able to glorify, uplift, and magnify your name. We thank you, dear Lord, even for my wife to be out of hospital. All of these things, we want to say glory and honor is unto you. And let the church say amen. amen. tithes and offerings. Uh, for the benefit of the help of the visitors and the, our friends who are here, the, our, our, our tithes and offerings will be collected by the deacons and the, um, the church building funds will be collected by, uh, by the deaconesses. So if you put the, um, the, the details up, you can also pay online as well. For those who wish to pay online, please do so online as well. So will the deacon and deaconesses come forward for tithes and offerings, please? Okay, let us, let us pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, this time, O oh Lord, you have given us the power to work in these times in which we live. We know we are living in, a, in hard times, dear Father. We know that, but even though we are living in a time that um, it's hard for people to sustain themselves in this world, you have given us the power to work, Lord, and you have given us the faith in you who looks after your people at all times, even times of crisis, Lord. Breathe us as we... We bring our monies to you, Lord, 
but it, it will be used wisely to tithe and offerings and other church building funds as well through, through here, here in this country and abroad. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we collect the offering, we'll sing, Oh, Give Thanks. today will be taken from Psalms 127 verses 1 to 5. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand and watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him, like arrows in the hands of a warrior and children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man who quiver, who quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they can contend with their opponents in court. Amen. At this time, we'll have our children's story. May the children come forward as we sing their song. Make 
the right choice. I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be. Good morning, children. I don't think you're hearing me. Let's start over here. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, Good morning boys and girls. Good morning. Good morning, boys and girls. Good afternoon. You don't want to be here today? No? You do? You sure? You have breakfast? What do you have for breakfast? Just asking, what do you have for breakfast? Is it nice? Bread and cake, okay, that's good. How are we doing today, older boys and girls? Good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is, if you're tuning in online, God bless you. We're doing good today? Did you have breakfast this morning? No, Sister Shafin, no? Oh my goodness. I thought you'd be a yam and banana sort of person for breakfast, but okay. Am I making your mouth water, people? Anyone else have breakfast this morning? Yes. Praise the Lord. So the rest of you didn't have anything to eat? No breakfast, Benjamin. You did? All right. Anyway, we'll talk about that afterwards. I've got a story. I've got a story. But before I do the story, I want you to help me with something, okay? Can you do that for me? I want everyone to stand to their feet, please, nice and, nice and lively, stand to your feet, and I want you to put yourself in order of shoe size without asking the person beside you what size shoe you are. All right, so let's make it interesting. We're going to have the biggest size shoe here. What's your name, young lady? What's your name, young lady? You don't want to tell me? Okay, the girl in the boots. So the lady in the boots... She's going to have the biggest size, we're just assuming, and over here is going to be the smallest size, okay? Can you do this as quickly as you can? You can't ask the person what size their shoe is. You have to use your imagination, use your eyes. So have a good look. Have a good look. I see my man in the, in the Air Force Ones. You look like they're kind of big. So just have a little look around. As quick as you can. Do you guys know the instructions? As quick as you can, quick as you can. So everyone with small feet over this size, with big feet over this side, as quick as you can. Okay. Not bad. Not bad. I'm going to ask you shoe size in a second. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I've got some Air Forces again. Uh-huh. Right. Are we almost done? We might need a little help. Thank you, my assistant. How are we doing so far? Are we good? Are we almost there? Shoe sizes. Okay, I see some switching going on. You might need to keep switching because I'm looking around and I don't think you're there just yet. I don't think you're there just yet. Let me know when you're finished. You done? Are you sure? You need to be in one long line. One long line. One long line. My sister, can you help them please? One long line. Just one long line. And then I'm going to see if you got it right or wrong. Okay. Okay, just one long line, one single file, please, one single file. Young lady, young lady, where are you fitting? Are you here? Are you here? Can you, can you move away um, uh, um, to the right a little bit for me? Just so that my sister can squeeze in the line. Just this way, please. That's it. Do you want to just go into the line? Perfect. Great stuff. Okay, fantastic. Are we there? Are we done? Are you sure? Okay. Can I ask you a shoe size, please? A size eight. Mercy. Okay. You think you're not sure. They look okay. Don't worry, don't take them off. We're good. We'll go for an eight. And yourself? 32. A 32? 32. A 42. I'm not good with European sizes. What's that? An That's eight as well. Okay. Is this your daughter? Okay, so you know. Size eight. I like your outfit, by the way. Oh, your mom. Okay, size eight. You're a size eight as well. You're a size, Jude? Eight as well. Jude, you're size eight. How old are you? Mercy. Your mom's going to have to have a shoe fund for you. What size are you, Kimona? Six, young man? Six? Four, Jesse? A grown up size three. Okay, and yourself? A four? Three? Six? Two and a half? Five. Oh, you got. Wait, 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 wait. You didn't get the memo. You're supposed to be way down this size. Okay, and yourself? You're not sure? Okay, and yourself? 13. A 13? A 7? Huh? 
A 37. What's that in UK sizes? 37. Is that five? Okay. And yourself? You're seven. And yourself? Seven as well. And yourself? Six? Thirteen? You're not sure? Five? And yourself? Five? Three? Four? Three? I think you guys are guessing. But that's okay. The, the age, not the shoe size. That's okay. My mom used to say, at your age, not your shoe size. Okay, we'll move on. Let's set about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. You guys did well. Wasn't quite in perfect order, but it doesn't really matter because the hardest task is you weren't supposed to ask the person their shoe size. Take a seat for me, please. Take a seat. My turn now. I went to a shop. Who likes, who likes good deals? Who likes good deals? You're talking, I'm talking to you, sister. What's your name? Cynthia. Sister Cynthia, you like a good deal? Mercy, what kind of deal do you like? Any type of deal, any type of deal. I like the sound of that. I like a good deal. I like to go into a shop and come back home and say, babes, look what I bought. <laughs> Guess how much I paid for this? And then I say to her, I got it in a sale, I got a bargain. I went into a shoe shop. I like shoes. I have more shoes than I have trainers. They probably all look the same because I like brogues, but hey, that's another thing. And I bought these shoes. How much do you think I paid for these shoes? How much do you think I paid for these shoes? 40 pounds? Don't answer, Janai. How much? 20? These are Jones bootmaker shoes. They're good quality shoes. Leather, leather sole and all the rest of it. 50 pounds. How much should I pay for these? 70, 60 or 70. Anybody else? A hundred. Twenty a hundred is not a bargain. Anyone else? Forty-five. Anyone else? Forty. Anyone else? Benjamin, how much did I pay for these shoes? Fifty. Children, how much did I pay for these shoes? Fifty-five pounds? Nope. Anyone else? A hundred pounds? No. I went into a shop. When I saw these in sale, I have to talk to my sister. Sister who likes Sister Cynthia. When I saw these in sale, I couldn't believe the price. I grabbed them and went straight to the till. They cost me five pounds. Five pounds. I told you I like a, I, I told you afterwards. I told you after where I bought the shoes. Five pounds. You know the greatest thing about this? The greatest, pardon? Nope, wasn't a charity shop. Was a proper shoe shop. Brand spanking you, never been worn. When I saw the price, I said, babes, I had to have them. I gave that person my five pounds, and I said to myself, I spend more on McDonald's. <laughs> Sorry, sister, um, about the veganism thing, you know, we're, I'm on my way. So anyway, so I bought these shoes, but there was one slight problem with these shoes. What was that problem? Okay, too tight? They definitely weren't too tight. Too big. Okay, but there's one manufactural problem with these shoes. What's the problem? Children, what's the problem with these shoes? They're not fake. They're genuine. <laughs> I tell you the shoe shop afterwards. What was the problem with these shoes? They are real leather. They don't fit me. That's one problem. But there's an issue with these shoes. Can you see by looking at them? One foot is bigger than the other. Now, now, now who knows what size shoe I am? Who knows what size shoe I am? What size shoe are my children? What size shoe am I? Huh? A five? No, man. Not 11. Not a 10. Not a six. Not 11. Not a nine. 12. I'm a size 12. I'm a size 12. That's right. Not a great thing when you're like 15 years old and can't buy nice trainers. Anyhow, let me not digress and talk about about not having nice things. Anyway, we move on. So one size shoe is a size, what, what is it? One is a 13, and what's the other size? A 14. Yeah. Listen, I knew the facts and I still bought it. You know why? Because it was five pounds. I said to myself, if I buy these, maybe I'll grow into them. So, so I have an illustration here that I want. I need a volunteer with big feet to help me out here. Who's got big feet? Come forward, Jude. Come forward. I want to see if you can make these shoes fit comfortably. If you can, 
they're yours. How does that sound? Where's your mum? Mummy, he will grow into these. He will grow into these. Take a seat for me, Jude. Jude, do you think you can make these shoes fit? Do you think he can make these fit children? Do you think he can make these fit parents? So, so I, have, I have these shoes and I have, I have brand new socks that I've never worn. And I want you to see if you can make these fit and see if you can walk in them quickly. Yeah? So I've got some socks, they've never been worn, they're brand new, okay? Try and see if you can pad out the shoes and make them fit. And I also have a cloth right here. You can stuff in the shoes. So you've got to be creative. You've got to make these shoes fit. You with me, Jude? Let's do it. Let's give him some encouragement, people. That's it. So you want to open them up. Try not to crease the leather. I might be able to sell them on eBay afterwards. Who knows? You open these. Ah, they're saying stuff the shoes of the socks. So you try and see if you can make them fit and walk in them. Do you think he's going to do it, children? Yeah. That's what I like to hear. They're behind you, Jude. They're behind you. So, so that's what happens. You see a bargain, you feel like you can't say no. Five pounds. Come on, Jude. Right, they've got some paper in them already. Let's see if you can make these shoes fit comfortably. What size are you again, Jude? There were eight. There's only a few differences in sizes. Eight to 13, it's no big difference. Small difference, right? Do you think he'll do it, children? That's right, slide your foot in there, young man. Maybe you've got too much in there. All right, they look big. Mercy look like clown shoes. What do you think? Do they look good? Do they fit? Can you walk in them? Yes. All right. Take a seat, please. Take a seat. Take a seat. How old are you, Jude? You're 11 and size 8. Don't worry, mommy. There's a few years. He'll fit into them. Thank you. Please take them off. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Since you children have, since you children have listened so well, I've got a prize for you. Do you like sweets? Are you allowed to eat sweets? If you meet me after the service, I have a bag of sweets there. They've got no pork gelatine in them, so we're good. If you meet me after the service, if your parents are alive, I can give you one. I'm so sorry I didn't bring any fruits. I am so sorry. People are looking at me funny. I think I'll stop now. Who knows why I bought those shoes in the shop? Because they were five pounds. Okay, okay. I wasn't paying. No, I knew they were five pounds. I knew they were off sizes, but I couldn't say no. The reason I bought them is I thought they'd be a great illustration. Do you know why? Why did I ask you guys to stand in different orders of shoe sizes? Do you know, Jesse? For the children's story. Yes, it was for the children's story. Thank you very much. The whole idea behind this is every single one of you is unique. The Bible says in Psalm 139 verse 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows them. I praise the Lord you read the Bible. Amen. Children, you are all so unique, and no one will walk in your shoes. That means no one will have your experiences. Your experiences will be different from the person beside you. It doesn't matter if you're the same age, same height, same size, or even have the same shoe size. You are all fearfully and wonderfully made, and you are unique in your own way. And there is no person on the face of the earth that is as beautiful or as wonderful as you. So I had these shoes. They were way too big. I asked you to put them on, see if they would fit. They would never fit him. Do you know why? Because they weren't right for him. Jude has to walk in his own shoes and have his own experiences. Same for you children. You walk in your own shoes and you have your own experiences because God wants great things for you. Young man? When you, when you say that no one's as beautiful or as clever as us, does that mean, does that include the parents as well? I think that's part two to the children's story, but yes. There is, oh, what's your name, young man? Aiden, there is only one you. You are not your parents and they are not you. 
They will do the very best to raise you in the admonition of the Lord, but there is only one you. I'm going to get questions. Young man. So if everyone is unique in their own way, so you're t and everyone has differences, so you're telling me there's one smart person in the whole world. Well, we're not talking about intelligence. We're talking about abilities. Oh, there are lots of great people in the world who are very smart, but there is only one you. There is only one you. We can talk more after church because I'm sure you want to talk to me. And I don't mind cutting my sermon short to talk to you children. So let's just pray. Who's going to pray for me? Who's going to pray? You're going to pray? Come forward, young lady. I had, you as well? You don't want to, okay. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. What's your name? Nasha. Nasha. Let's pray for us, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for this children's story and that we were able to come to church today. Help us all to know that we're fearfully and wonderfully made and that nobody can be in our shoes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Please go back to your seats. God bless you all. Thank you. I just hope we learn something from that shoes experience. Um, it is my privilege to introduce um, the, the, the speaker of the day. And he is no other than Pastor Micah Campbell. He is the di youth director for the North Indian Conference. And he is married with his children, and they are here with him. But before you hear him speak, we're going to have a meditation from Sister Kerry Han. The song I'm going to sing this morning is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And I just want us to think about these words and really acknowledge how deep God's love for us. I know around this time that the world acknowledges Easter. But we don't need to, we don't have to buy into all the holidays, but we need to still remember Christ coming to die for us, the love that he had for us. And I think sometimes we don't always stop and pause and have these moments. So I just want us to do that today in this song. Which 
Each mother chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross my sins upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished afternoon church I think we can do a bit better than that God bless you sister carry on what a beautiful voice huh what do you say church amen amen I wish I could sing like you I really do I wouldn't stop you've got a good voice God bless you in your ministry God bless the musicians the praise team the band it's always good to have good music in the house of the Lord what do you say Okay. We good? Praise the Lord. I want to bring you greetings from the NEC. 
I want to bring you greetings from our president and also the administrative staff within our conference. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. I want to thank your elders for having me. Elders, give me a wave. Give me a wave, elders. God bless you all and thank you so much for the ministry you have within this church. I also want to thank your senior pastor, Pastor Jermaine Swaby, for affording me the privilege to stand before you today. I'm here with my mom, my wife, and our children, and it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen and amen. Easter is an interesting time of year. It's a time of year where people go out to the shops and they buy Easter eggs. Man, I couldn't believe the price of Easter eggs. Well, I don't buy Easter eggs. It's pagan, Easter eggs. It's about Jesus and his sacrifice. Who's buying Easter eggs? Well, I'm just joking. If you want to buy Easter eggs, it's up to you. If you want to buy chocolate, that's your business. I don't mind. It's not a big deal. But they are expensive. But the truth is, a lot of people forget what Easter really is about. They think it's about Easter eggs and about the Easter bunny and about receiving gifts. But truly, it's about the death, the resurrection, and eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Like, you strip that back, and you might as well not have Easter. Easter isn't just about Easter bun. I remember Mike, I went to the shop this week, and I couldn't believe the price of Easter bun. The guy was sending me an Easter bun for 11 pounds, and he said the premium one was 13 pounds. I said, man, I can make my own. Uh, vegan Easter bun, hey? <laughs> the truth is, Easter is a time when we can really evangelize about Jesus. I don't know about you, but I love these we might call them pagan holidays, but I love these holidays. I love Easter. I love Christmas. You know why? Because my neighbors are more receptive to hear about Jesus at Easter. They're more receptive to hear about the birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas. We need to monopolize on these holidays and make sure that we talk to people about Jesus when they are receptive and willing to hear. Don't just wait for the big revivals and campaigns and crusades. You talk to them about Jesus, especially when they are receptive or at least familiar with what these specific days mean to them. I like the fact that you're hearing me. The title of my sermon today is Don't Play With Arrows, They're Dangerous. Don't play with arrows, they're dangerous. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much that during this Easter week, we can truly connect with you. We ask that you forgive us for all of our sins, that you speak through my heart, and that you allow me to be an empty vessel that you can fill. I have a message that comes from you, and I pray, Jesus, that it will captivate me once more the same way it did when I wrote it. Be with the members, Lord, the recipients who hear your word. Let them not see me, but see you. In your name we pray, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalm 127, verse 1 to 5. That's Psalm 127, verse 1 to 5. When you found it, say amen. Psalm, one, Psalm 127, verse 1 to 5. Are we together? All right. This is what the Word of God says. Psalm 127, verse 1 to 5. We together? It says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in what? In vain. Verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like the arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. The Bible says, happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Mm -hmm. We together so far. I love this passage of scripture it was written by Solomon. Many people think that all of the Psalms are written by David. They actually weren't. You have a portion written by David, 
some by, the, by Asaph, some by the sons of Korah. Some theologians have said even Moses wrote a couple. And then you have Solomon who wrote some of the Psalms. 1 to 6 was by Solomon. 1 to 7 was by Solomon. 1 to 8 was by Solomon. And you can read on that little subsection, they're written by Solomon, a man of great wisdom. When I read my Bible, I understand that a man called Samuel went to meet a man called Jesse. I like the name Jesse. So much so I call my son Jesse. The Bible makes it clear that Jesse had how many sons? Oh, someone said it with confidence. How many sons did Jesse have? Jesse, the father of David. How many sons? He had eight sons. Praise the Lord. The Bible says he had eight sons. Now, Jesse had eight sons. Samuel was instructed by God to choose a new king of Israel. I see God being a little bit disrespectful to King Saul, but I love it. You see, King Saul was the king. Are, we with, are you with me so far? Saul was chosen by the people. God did not want Israel to have a king in the first place. You see, back in the Bible, you had judges, and judges ruled the nations. They were like the leaders and authority figures and your prime minister. I guess they were like God's representative. But the people of Israel were fed up with judges, so they asked for a king. The Bible makes it clear that they chose a man called Saul. Saul was, the Bible says, handsome and tall in stature and quite strong. And so he probably looked a little bit like Benjamin, you know, tall and, and handsome and strong. You hear me, Benjamin? That's a free plug right there, bro. That's a free plug right there. And so they chose Saul. And the Bible makes it clear that Saul was a really good king to start off with. But the Bible also makes it clear that his time would come to an end. So God spoke to Samuel and God told Samuel to choose a successor while Saul was still living. That's kind of disrespectful, right? The whole idea is you got a successor when someone passed away. But God prepared for the next king even when Saul was still living. Samuel goes to Jesse. Jesse brings seven sons. David ends up being the king. Bible says he had curly hair and he was kind of ruddy, had a really nice disposition. And the Bible makes it clear that irrespective of the mistakes that he would make later on in his life, he was defined before he became a king as a man after God's own heart. Powerful, right? Irrespective of the mistakes that he would make in the future, he was depicted as a man after God's own heart. Anyway, David looks for a successor. On his deathbed, he decides to go through the son's names, but to choose Solomon to be king. Do you know how many children David had? Do you know how many children David had? Not 30. The Bible records, the Bible records 10 of David's sons. I'm not sure how many daughters he had, but I'm, I'm sure according to the word of God that he had 10 sons. So David's thinking about which son to be king. Well, it's not going to be Amnon because Amnon was the one who R-A-P-E-D'd his half-sister Tamar. You with me? Then he ended up losing his life at the hand of Absalom. And Absalom was, was the third son, but was running away from David, and they were issues, and he ended up losing his life because his hair got caught in some tree branches, you remember? And then he got killed. You see, David's second son was called Daniel, but he wasn't right. His fourth son was called Adonijah, but he wasn't to be chosen. His fifth son was called Sheptia, but he wasn't to be chosen. His sixth son was called Ithrim, but he wasn't to be chosen. His seventh son was called Shemir, but he wasn't to be chosen. His eighth son was called Shobab, but Shobab didn't show up and wasn't to be chosen. His ninth son was called Nathan, but he wasn't to be chosen. And so David went for his tenth son, which was called Solomon. Let me put this into context. It's like King Charles skipping past William, skipping past George, skipping past Louis, skipping past Charlotte, and making Prince Harry king of England. I wouldn't mind that, you know. Have mercy. Can you imagine if Meghan Markle became hmm, queen and, and, and Harry was king? Be a very interesting time, huh? I'm sure it'd be a celebration for every single ethnic minority, huh? We've made it. Let me not say too much about that. Anyway, 
Because of what David wanted to do, David wanted a man who would follow the instructions of God. And so, so the Bible makes it clear that he himself, Solomon, became the king. Now Solomon wrote a psalm in the book of Psalm 127 talking about the value of children. I recognize that some parents have lots of children and they are seen as a commodity. Oh, you're not hearing me. Sometimes children are seen to, to show up and keep their mouth shut or be seen and not heard. I know in my home church growing up, I remember children had to have this specific dress code when on the platform. Remember, mom? Like you couldn't wear a tie. Or you couldn't go on the platform if you had no tie and no jacket. Even if it didn't fit, they'd take it off an elder's back, put it on yours to go up to the front. Uh-huh. I remember in my home church, like no shade on my home church. God bless everyone there. But in my home church, I remember that, that elders were always senior men in age, but were never young men who were growing up. I remember that the movers and shakers within my home church were people of great authority that had a lot to say, but little to hear. I know you don't have that problem here in Windsor Street, huh? And so, and so Solomon writes a, a psalm, which is supposed to be a song, right? And that song talks about children are a heritage of the Lord. They are a blessing from God. You see, the instruction that comes from God is that you will be fruitful and multiply. And even if the Lord has not blessed you with children, if there are children in your midst, you still as a Christian have a huge responsibility. We are all responsible for other people's children. We are responsible to keep them safe from predators. You hear me? Like, don't think just because we go to an Adventist church, there are no predators. The Bible makes it clear that the wheat and tears will grow together until the harvest. Therefore, it is our job to make sure that we protect these children. The Bible makes it clear that it would be better that you tie a millstone around your neck and cast yourselves to the depths of the ocean than you offend or hurt one of these little ones. You're awfully quiet today, church. As we read through the word of God and as we read through Psalm 127, uh, Solomon talks about the Lord building a house and talks about unless the Lord is part of that, we labor in vain. Uh, unless there is a watchman that watches, we work in vain. Verse 2, it is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up eight late to eat the bread of sorrows for so he gives his beloved sleep. And so he gives his beloved sleep or rest. Sometimes, church, we can get so uh, gun ho about doing ministry that we forget to take care of ourselves. I want to appeal to every single person that does a night shift. I appreciate you. My wife works nights quite often, and I never got a good sleep till she comes home. You with me? Because you get all sorts of crazy people in the hospitals and stuff, and I never feel comfortable till she comes home, until she's in bed, I know, she, I know she's safe. I salute anybody that works nights, because I know how hard it is. I know it messes up your, your sleep pattern, your circadian rhythm. You need sleep to replenish your bodies. Am I making sense so far? But not too much sleep, otherwise you become spiritually lazy. Like some of us in this church get too much rest, so we become spiritually lazy. There is a huge work to do. And right now, we are situated in the heart of Birmingham. There's about five mosques not too far from here. Am I making sense there? There's a Gurdwara temple just up the road. There are people that are walking out of their religions looking for a place of safe refuge and a place to bring their children because they are tired of the tyranny that they've experienced, maybe culturally, and they are tired of the misogyny, and they are tired of the difficulties they have faced, and they are looking for a safe haven, a place where they can bring their children that they believe are of value and a reward. And based on this, all we have to do is open our doors and be accommodating for them. Are you hearing me? I'm sure you're doing this already, huh? You see, sometimes we forget that children copy what they are told. They copy what they hear. They replicate what they see. They emulate what they experience. They demonstrate what they observe. 
There are times as parents we get angry for our children's mannerisms and their behavioral characteristics, not recognizing that they are a visual representation of ourselves. They copy the very things that they see us do. And sometimes we get annoyed, but we don't realize that they are saying and copying the very things that they hear, that they see, and that they experience. In other words, we are products of our parental caregivers. And, and part of that production line means we have to invest words of wisdom in able to encourage them to grow spiritually. I'm convinced that the most important thing isn't what you leave isn't what you leave behind for your children but what you leave in your children i believe it's important for us as christians and as parents and parent figures to make sure that we invest in our children and in the young people of this church so that they can grow in the admonition of jesus christ and one day be powerful leaders copying and emulating the very nature of what we have taught them over these years Children become tweens. Tweens become teens. Teens become youth. Youth become adults. We've created as STAs this subculture, right? We've created this subculture of youth. You know, when I talk to people outside the church about youth, they, they talk about children. You know, in our church, we say youth are people who are 18 to 30. In the real world, you're an adult already. As soon as you hit 18, you are an adult. Am I making sense right now? Yeah, you, you, you drive a car, you get stopped by police. They're not going to say, hey, I'm, I'm part of the youth department. I'm good. They're going to say you're an adult. You speed in, that's three points. You don't get a blight because you are 18. When you are 18, you are an adult. You hear me so far, people? We've created a subculture, and we've created a subculture to keep young people in church and to bridge the gap. Because I believe that bridging the gap is really important. Are you with me so far? I believe that it's important for young people to be able to assimilate and connect with something that's relevant in their life in church. If I'm going to church and I'm constantly being told what not to do or constantly being told rules and regulations, I might feel like leaving, creating my own thing. And I think it's really hard because we want to maintain Christian spiritual principles but also want to make sure that we create a haven for young people to grow in. You hearing me, people? Just like when we send our young people to university, we send them to university to get an education, and we pray that with that education, they get a great job and a fantastic career, and one day raise a family, and one day bring home grandchildren. Well, I hope God comes before all of that. My daughter's getting married and grandchildren? No, 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 no. I'm just playing. We also recognize that there's this thing called Gillick competence, which refers to a person who has the capacity to make decisions for themselves. If a child or a teenager is about 16 years of age, or even as young as 15, but, are, but is Gillick competence, that means that they have the competence to make a decision for themselves. They actually understand the rationalization of their actions. Am I making sense? Based on this, they are treated like adults. They are given responsibilities like adults. And they are treated and created like adults. Let me just make this clear, friends of mine. I really believe that the leadership within our church, one day will change. Am I making sense? One day, I won't be youth director. Listen, session's coming in September. I might be coming back to a church, and that's okay, because I miss having a church. But the reality is this. Listen to this carefully. One day it will be a younger person, and then a younger person, and then an even younger person. It's my job to make sure that we do something called succession planning. Some people are scared of succession planning, right? They're scared because they think that if I train you, my brother, what's going to happen is you're going to take my place, and I'm going to get pushed by the wayside. But let me tell you this. If I train you and you do a better job by, than me, that's even better because then God will take me somewhere else. Listen, man, there's no ego in heaven. You think we're going to get to heaven and have one big ego about someone that's got 10 stars in their crown and me that's got one? I just want to get there. And based on this, I have to start treating people with love and respect, understanding that we are all growing in the, in the oneness and fulfillment of Jesus Christ. 
Let's talk about being an adult here. We talk about youth. An adult is someone who is 18 years of age in this country. An 18-year-old has the ability to stand for election as an MP or a local councillor or a mayor. An 18-year-old has the power to serve on a jury or even be tried in a magistrate's court and go to prison if found guilty of a criminal offence. An 18-year-old has the ability and the power to make a will. They can go to a pawn shop and pawn some stuff. Pawn spelled P-A-W-N, making sure you're with me. An 18-year-old is, is also the age is also the age when you have the legal right to vote in a local and general election. An 18-year-old can get married without parental permission. An 18-year-old can, uh, can see their original adoption certificates and the original names on their registration of birth. An 18-year-old can consent to giving their body to be used in a medical study. An 18-year-old can carry an organ or a donor card. Let's talk about leisure. An 18-year-old is the legal age in the UK to buy cigarettes, rolling tobacco, and cigarette paper. I know you guys don't buy none of that stuff. I'm just reading to you what's in the script. Okay, you ain't going to buy no cigarette paper. An 18-year-old can, I'm going to skip that one, can buy an alcoholic drink in a pub or in a bar. We don't know about that, huh? I've heard, I've heard. An 18-year-old can buy a motorbike above 125cc with a license. An 18-year-old can drive lorries between 3,500kg or 7,500kg with the appropriate license. An 18-year-old can drive a bus under some specific circumstances, such as if you are learning to take your passenger or carry a vehicle PCV test. An 18-year-old can access their trust fund. Now listen to this carefully. In the Jewish culture, the term youth referred to youthfulness or being young opposed to being an adult. At age 12, a girl becomes a woman and has something called a bat mitzvah. At 13, a boy becomes a man and has something called a bar mitzvah. I'm saying this to illustrate this point, friends. That we have so many people in our churches that are aspiring adults they are almost there and on that journey they can drive vehicles they can make decisions that can change someone's course of life they can even adopt a child and give a child a wonderful life and so if the world treats them like adults then we have to make sure that we do too because these young people are dangerous to the devil in our churches i don't know you're hearing me man our young people are dangerous to the devil in our churches. That means that they have an amazing purpose. Can you imagine what it was like when, when our, well, who's our prime minister? Let me test you. Who's the prime minister of our country? Now come and say it like confidence. Who is he? Richie who? Sunak. You heard of him before, right? Listen, he's an ethnic minority. Can you imagine what it was like when he told his family 10 years ago, one day I'm going to be the prime minister of England? They probably looked at him and thought to himself, man, just, what are you talking about? Can you imagine? He has shown us as ethnic minorities that it's possible. Imagine if someone in our church became the prime minister of Great Britain. Imagine someone from our community was put in that position, able to be a mover and shaker and to make changes within our church. Can you imagine what that would be like? You see, when, when Solomon talks about Children being a heritage of the Lord. We have to understand that what a heritage is. A heritage is something that's passed down through legacy. A heritage is something that you receive. A heritage is something that's powerful. A heritage is something that will prosper. A heritage is something that will have leadership value. A heritage is something that will have accolade associated with it. If our children are this wonderful heritage of the Lord, then we need to be gearing them for amazing opportunities that will transform their lives and the lives of other people. Amen. I don't send my children to school just for an education or free childcare. I send my children to school because I want them to be the best that they can possibly be. They choose their path and their career. That's up to them. But I want them to be the best that they can be. I want them to be leaders and not followers. I want them to be the head and not the tail. Am I making sense there, brothers and sisters? 
I know that Caribbeans and Africans, we believe in education, especially within the SCA church. It's a middle class sort of movement. Most people find themselves at university with one or two degrees and find themselves in a good job because we believe in pushing our children for excellence. Why? Because God requires our very best. Let's go back to the sermon. You are dangerous to the enemy when you are likened to an arrow. Let me give you the context in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13 to 22. The Philistines had Israel under siege and prevented the blacksmiths from making swords. They had equipment. But in order for Israelites to, to sharpen their plow, they had to go to the Philistines, the enemy, and pay big bucks in order for them to sharpen their plow or their utensils that they used to cook with or their instruments. All of their blacksmiths were taken away. They had no swords. They had no knives. They didn't even have a machete to chop down the vegetation in the field. You hear me? I'll give you the reference right now. It's 1 Samuel 13. I'll read from verse 19 to 22. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19 to 22. You with me? It says this. There were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. Verse 20. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshare, picks, axes, or sickles, they had to take them to the Philistine blacksmiths. The charge were as, charges were as follows. A quarter of an ounce of silver for sharpening a plowshare or a pick. An eighth of an ounce for sharpening an axe or making the point of an axe good. Verse 22. So on the day of battle, none of the people of Israelites had a sword or a spear except Jonathan and Saul. I don't know if you're hearing where I'm going with this, people, but this gets me excited. You know, when you read on the chapter, you find out that there's a man called David, you're with me, who fights a Philistine giant called Goliath and goes to him with five smooth stones, but only uses one. And he comes to Goliath with fear and confidence and almost this spiritual cockiness, knowing that with, he has the confidence to kill the Philistine giant Goliath. He didn't fear death. You don't even hear him writing a long sonnet or a poem or even a psalm about going to fight Goliath. You know why? Because he knew he couldn't lose. He was anointed king. God's not going to anoint you king to then have you killed. I don't know if you're hearing me. You think God's going to waste his time? Go get Samuel, who's an old man, to fill a ram's horn, to go through all of your siblings, to pour oil on your head, and to make you the next king of Israel, only to fight a giant and die? God isn't slack concerning his promises, friends of mine. And this is why David had confidence to fight Goliath, because he knew that he had already won the battle in the name of the Lord. The only person, watch this, who had a sword or a spear, or even a javelin, was King Saul. That means every time the Hebrews or the Israelite army fought against the Philistines, they were using bow and arrow. They didn't have anything else. They didn't have all of the things that I've just mentioned, because the Bible makes it clear that they lost those things. But David, man, had faith to know that all he needed was one stone and the power of God to penetrate the heart of his giant. Before this, Israel was used by judges, as I mentioned. Remember Samson with his seven locks, a mighty man that killed a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey. And then he killed 3,000 Philistines in the temple before he died. The Philistines and the Hebrews had always gone backwards and forwards against each other fighting. But the victory wasn't in their might, but was in the power of God. I say this to suggest, brothers and sisters, that our young people are arrows. And they are powerful and we are the bow. And an arrow fires in the direction that we set that bow. Anyone done archery before? Send your children to Abadaran and we'll do some archery with them. Archery is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it hurts your wrist a few times when you get it wrong. Am I making sense? But when you fire those arrows, you realize how dangerous they are. If someone stands in, the front, of, in, in front of an arrow, they could end up losing their life. 
Young people, you are powerful arrows for the Lord. And I pray that throughout the course of your life, the Lord will guide you and show you exactly where you will fire. So you will fire change in your communities. That you will fire worship and spirituality in your homes. That you will fire good education in education system. That you will fire an amazing career that will transform your lives. That you will fire faith in the hearts of those whose claims are not to be non-believers. That you will fire change within your church. That one day you will stand on your church board and smile knowing that you are a powerful person of value going to instigate, instigate change from the organizational leader's perspective. But it all starts with you believing in yourself. I can preach and I can sweat as much as I want, but you have to believe it yourself. And if there's no one to tell you, you come and find me and I'll remind you that you are powerful. Because Psalms 139 verse 14 says, I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your what? Works. And my soul knows them. Oh, one more time. I will praise you for I am and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and my soul knows it well. One more time. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and my soul knows them well. I don't mind if you forget everything I've preached, but what I do mind is that you forget how wonderfully and fearfully and wonderfully you are made. You are made in the powerful image of God, and you are dangerous to the enemy. You know, sometimes the devil gives you trials, and the reason why he gives you trials and not your friends, and sometimes it feels as though you're backpedaling, going round and round in circles, trying to achieve and just treading water. The reason why it sometimes feels this way is because the devil knows how dangerous you are to the kingdom of hell Amen. and how amazing you are to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. The devil knows what heaven is like. He once was there. Yeah. He doesn't want you to taste eternal life. He doesn't want you to eat from the tree of life. He doesn't want you to walk on streets paved with gold. He doesn't want you to run and not get weary and walk and not get faint. He doesn't want you to understand that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And he doesn't want you to experience this because he wants you to have a demise like him in hell. But Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins that we may have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so when we hear about these stories about the Israelites struggling and not having weapons to go to war, we can stand on our feet and celebrate knowing that they had Jesus Christ who fought those battles for them. And based on that, they had victory in him. There we go, beat them. So friends, I've come to the end of my message. And I just want to encourage you one more time to understand that Jesus Christ is doing exceedingly great things for you in your life, but you just don't know it yet. Because you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, or even next year. But I guarantee you, friends, that you will not be in the same situation next week next month or next year that you are now and all you need to do is believe on jesus and have faith knowing that he who began a good work will complete it to the end so friends you've heard the message and you just want to say lord i really need you in my life i need to be dangerous to the enemy perhaps there are things that are in your life that you are struggling with Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's, your, it's the relationship with your siblings. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe it's a relationship with your spouse or, or someone who you want to be your spouse. Maybe you're still searching for your spouse. Maybe you want to progress in your career and feel like you've been stagnant for too long. Maybe you're at university and the coursework's just piling up and it's too hard. Perhaps you struggle with exams. Perhaps, perhaps the, 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 the SATs or the SAQs or whatever it is are so difficult for you that you are struggling. You don't know whether it's answer A, B, C, or D, or other. Perhaps it's something else. You're struggling with your sexuality. We don't talk about that in church, huh? Perhaps you're struggling with your identity. Perhaps you're struggling with your faith. Perhaps you're struggling feeling valuable. 
because you've been through some historical trauma that's made you or rendered you feeling inadequate. Perhaps church doesn't hit like it used to. Sermons are too long. Praise team is okay. Musicians, yeah, I've heard it all before. But maybe the truth is you're trying to fill a void with something else. And right now, Jesus wants to say to you, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. And I promise to give you rest. Is there someone here today that wants to say, Lord, listen, I just need to be dangerous to the enemy. I need to be dangerous to the enemy. Right now, I'm dangerous to myself and my own salvation. I just want to be down dangerous to the enemy. Stand to your feet if you want to be dangerous to the enemy. Praise the Lord. You've heard the sermon. You want to be dangerous to the enemy. You want Jesus to do some great things in your life, but you have to acknowledge that you need him to help you to be dangerous. You need him to help you to realize that you can do abundantly and exceed him more than you can ever imagine through faith in Jesus Christ. But right now you need to say, Lord, have your way with me. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I stand before these people as a pastor, but I stand before you as Micah. I recognize, Lord Jesus, that I stand with them in solidarity. Recognizing that I need to be dangerous to the enemy. There are things in my life that aren't perfect. Characteristics that I want to change. And so I ask that you humble me, Jesus. And that you remind me, Lord Jesus, that I can have freedom from sin and victory in you like they can. We're in this race together there, Jesus. And sometimes we forget this. But I ask that you remind us daily that there is nothing too big or too great for you to do. So may you forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from unrighteousness. Move in our lives and allow us to recognize that it's never too late right now for us to give our lives to you. So please, Jesus, make us dangerous to the enemy. Sharpen us as arrows. Allow us to spiritually be sharp. May you fire us, Lord, and may we fire into the hearts of believers and non-believers, encouraging their faith and reminding them that through you, there is eternal life and salvation. So we love you, Jesus, but we need a bit more help because there are issues, some of which I have mentioned and some of which I haven't mentioned, that people are going through. Personal struggles, historical things that may have happened in our lives that we just need to lay at your feet. So, Lord, take our burdens. Carry them over your shoulders. Carry us in your arms and hold us close to your heart, reminding us that you will never leave us nor forsaken, forsake us. And even when it seems as though there are no footprints, it's because you have carried us. We love you, Jesus. We magnify your name. And we ask that you never allow us to forget this true Easter meaning. Your birth, your sacrifice, and salvation in you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen, church. Can we please stand as we sing our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance.
Jesus, this is our story and this is our song. And we will praise you all of our days. So Jesus, we ask that you continue to bless us. Move in our lives. We thank you so much for always being there for us and promising never to leave us nor forsake us. Amen. As we leave, we'll sing a blessing.